passion, focus, discipline. This is the Zero Excuses Podcast. Each and every week, we talk to high-performing, inspirational athletes, entrepreneurs, and leaders. We ask powerful questions to extract their tools, strategies, and life lessons for you to crush your excuses, to break out of your comfort zone, and accomplish your ambitious dreams and goals. Here's your host, Kenyon Zitzka. Hey, hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the podcast. Appreciate you taking time out of your schedules to spend a few minutes with me and my guest today, Mike Giannoulis. He has a very inspirational uh, story. He has a very interesting uh, background and has some really interesting uh, lessons and stories to share with us through his journey uh, through his life. And uh, he's going to share some, uh, you know, it's it's a very interesting story about how he started a, uh, a goat farm. Uh, is is has his first entrepreneurial journey, and then he's gone on to succeed in his own life. He's uh, broken through some some huge uh, barriers in his life, such as losing several hundred pounds. He's he was actually featured on an ABC uh, uh, reality weight loss show for a year, and you know he shares a bit about that journey. And you know, there's a lot of practical knowledge and, and a lot of. Um, a lot of discipline and conviction that he shares with us. So, you know, definitely take some notes as always, you know, definitely if you want, if you're tuning into the show, make it your standard operating procedure to grab a pen and paper before you hit play on these. Anyways, a couple quick reminders before we get into the conversation with Mike is if you haven't already done so, appreciate it. If you head over to iTunes, made it simple for you guys, kenyanzitska.com slash iTunes, take you right to where you need to go. No searching or anything, no excuse. And subscribe, rate, and leave us a, a review. Uh, it helps get the word out about what we're doing here. Let's uh, lets other people know that what we're doing here is valuable and it's making an impact on the world. And also while you're there, don't forget to also share this with a friend or family member who will get value out of it. Someone who you think would, uh, you know, it would make an impact on. And the last reminder is one thing that I'm doing here in 2019 is trying to reach as as many people as possible because you know I'm getting ready to retire from the military and one of the things that I'm going to miss about that is is mentoring people and seeing seeing my interaction with them have an effect on their lives and help them reach their goals. So what I'm doing here in 2019 is offering people a free 30 minute consult with me personally if any of these topics you want to take a deeper dive on, we could do that in, in, in this uh, quick 30 minute session. And you can schedule a time with me at kenyanzitska.com slash call. It takes you right to my calendar and you can book a mutually convenient time to connect with me. All right, guys, enough on all that. Let's get into the conversation with Mike. Mike Giannoulis, thanks for taking time out of your, uh, I'm sure, hectic schedule to join us here on the uh, Zero Excuses podcast. Excited to finally get our schedules lined up to have this conversation. Hey, yeah, I'm happy to be here, man. Awesome, man. So I know you've been through a lot in your life. You've had quite a, a interesting journey. You've started goat farms. You've uh, been on reality TV shows. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't do you justice uh, by trying to introduce you myself. So why don't you give yourself a quick introduction, tell us a little bit about you and love to uh, dive into uh, your backstory. Thanks, man. Yeah. So my name is Michael Giannoulis and I am a, uh, a founder, a co-founder, entrepreneur, CEO, investor, um, creative type person. I, I love solving problems. I love helping companies grow and scale. I love solving complex problems. And most of all, I love to learn. Um, that's probably like my, well, that's what I do for fun. My wife finds me very, very odd. <laughs> it's all like my idea of fun. And I don't know if, if uh, there's other guys who deal with this, but whenever I'm in the car with her, I want to play podcasts or I want to play like audio books. And she'll just look at me and be like, this is so boring and just want to <laughs> turn it off, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, and I, it's funny because you see that trend, like I think 80% of people that play podcasts are men. So I don't know why that is, but uh, you know, there's a, uh, you know, so anyway, for me though, I, I, like that stuff. I just love to always be trying to learn something new, um, especially business. Uh, my background, um, I started, like you brought up the goat farm story, the infamous goat farm. If you want to <laughs> jump in, you want to jump, jump into that. I, 
I can oh, share yeah. that one real fast. Too. So, so when I was young, you know, when I was 18, the very first thing I ever bought when I got a credit card, just to give you an idea, was the Carlton Sheets No Money Down Real Estate Buying Program. And um, I went through that course and I actually put an offer on a million dollar property that was accepted that I tied up for about a month or two. And I had no idea what I was doing, didn't know how to do anything. And actually within about two months, I couldn't actually pay for the property. And I just told them, hey, I'm sorry. And thankfully they were cool because they could have been like, we're coming after you. But I had just turned yeah. 18 and I think they kind of knew I was a punk kid, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but that just shows that I was always trying. You know, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll try. And um, so anyway, when I was 19, I actually went away to Illinois where I was going to a Bible college. At that time, I thought I was going to be a pastor. Actually, I was kind of on that track. And uh, while I was there, the friend I was uh, staying with, and he, he, he uh, was a uh, farmer, and, um, and he, he basically came up with this idea that we should have a goat farm and that we could use kind of the goats and the business side of the farming to be um, a like a job for troubled men. So we would create oh, like this yeah. troubled man's program. We had this idea to build housing, lodging, and we even had like where we could work with um, courts out of like Chicago to instead of sending these, these young, you know, kids, you know, 18 to 25, instead of sending them off to prison, they could come to the farm, work, kind of, you know, go to Bible stuff, you know, that kind of thing, if they would opt in for it. And so anyway, that was the whole strategy. Um, the big issue that we faced was we were new at it. So I had never done anything. I'm not a farmer type. I don't do any of that stuff. I'm from the city. I'm from Tampa Bay area. Um, I had an aunt who I grew up around. She had cows, but it was like more of a tax thing, you know, like it wasn't like a real farm farm. And so, you know, long story short, we kind of dug in and we, and we went through it and I, and I did a lot of the math and the behind the scenes and the discussions with the people selling the goats and on and on. And we ended up buying, you know, not like 10 goats or 20 or 30 or even 100. We bought five hundred dairy goats wow. and because that wasn't en enough the crazy part was all of them were pregnant so they all came to us pregnant wow. set set to have their kids within about a month um so i was joking about it it must have been a really happy uh boy goat who had some fun oh, yeah. for for a bit uh, but i don't even know what you call them i'm sure there's some other proper term for them. maybe buck maybe i don't know yeah. but anyway all these goats come off you know one thing they don't teach you in school is when a goat is transferred there's a lot of stress there yeah and, and that stress led to a lot of early pregnancies so we had goats coming off the trucks with kids already popping out and wow. my job for about two months almost solid was just pulling out goat kids left and right. And, you know, they all have one, two, three kids at a time. And so at our peak, there was over a thousand of these things. Wow. And we had to hand bottle feed every baby goat twice a day. And we had to hand pump the milk from every goat twice a day. So by the time you would get done with your, you know, round one, it was already time to start round two. Like I would, re I would wake up. And be like, where am I? I would be, I would fall asleep with my hands on the udders, just and wake up. Hours had gone by. I was like in a straw field of you know, and all kinds of bad stuff there. But anyway, that went on for quite a while. But we ran into a real big snag, which was we couldn't get our waste treatment approved, which basically is a, a fancy way of saying when the goats poop, where does it end up? And we had the EPA was involved. They was like, you know, all the regulatory stuff was going down. And basically they kept denying our, uh, our engineers had to design all this stuff and like curve the earth. So it all it would go a certain way. And I believe there was like a stream 
in the back and there was like a fish in that stream that couldn't be exposed. It was just one of those crazy things. And long story short, the EPA, I believe, and this is just what I believe. I don't know all this to be for sure, but it put pressure on the um, FSA, which was like the farmer services thing. And they had provided funding for this whole project. So they actually locked all the funds. Mm. So we couldn't pay staff. We couldn't buy food for the goats. We couldn't pay vendors and all these things kind of went bad. Now, thankfully I was more like a consultant. The, um, I wasn't an owner on the company. We were saving me for like the expansion. So we're like, right. well, you do first when we expand then you'll add on. Um, but basically long story short, the government stepped in and they repossessed the goats. So You've watched all those late night info, you know, infomercials where they're like, oh, my, my car got, got repossessed and my house got foreclosed on. It's like, no, we've had goats repossessed, which you even, wow. you've probably never heard those two words used in the same sentence, right? Um, so that was a major fail for me. I kind of went back home after that, pretty disappointed and kind of sad and a little bit angry as well because I feel like it could have went a better way. We didn't really have a good strategy. I was super young. I didn't have a, you know, much experience. I think now I would never go through that in the same way. Now I tell people what's the number one thing that I got from that. People yeah. always want to know. And I always just say, don't buy goats. That's the number <laughs> one lesson, right? Um, no, I mean, in, in reality, it's, it's, you shouldn't get involved in things until you really understand them, you know, yeah. and you have a really good background in that area or at least experience of some sort. So, you know, that was one of my first forays into, you know, business. Um, <clears throat> and it, it, it didn't go quite that well, but I, I learned a ton from that. You know, I definitely, right. you know, discovered a lot about myself and sort of where I fall short and, and where I need help and how to work with other people, how to manage a staff. And, and so, you know, that was my background for a while. Then I kind of came home. Played around for a few years, trying college here and there, little things, you know, jobs. It wasn't until I was about 24 that I finally got serious about starting my own thing. Yeah, I, you know, you mentioned that uh, you'd, you'd strike me as a person who uh, says yes and, and figures things out later. Is, did that kind of, did that experience kind of temper that attitude within yourself? Or, or are you still now, hey, let's, uh, let's figure it out enough. And then, and then let's, let's, let's hit you know, it. I, you know, I used to be more of a yes person and there's still my natural tendency is to want to say yeah. yes to things, but I actually, you know, what was a, a very big breakthrough for, for me was a book called essentialism. Uh, mm-hmm. um, and in, in that book, it, one of the real breakthroughs for me was he was saying, when you say yes to something, automatically you're saying no to something else. Right. So in reality, you're always saying no. And the sad part is when we say yes to something, usually the things we're saying no to are family and friends and our, and our own private time, right? right? So it's like, do you want to tell your wife, no, you can't go out this night because you told some guy, yeah, we're going to start a sports betting blog, you know, I don't know what, you know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like it's weird stuff, right? I get hit up constantly with ideas and we should try this and we should try that. And what if we did this, especially when success, if you, if you have any success, one of the principles sort of of that is you start attracting opportunity, right? right. Um, because people want to be involved in that. They have ideas and they think, oh, this guy might know. And, and so kind of the bigger you get, the bigger you grow start attracting all these things in. So it becomes very much about creating pro, uh, a process. So one of the things that I do is I create a life plan. And the life plan allows me to pick the five to seven areas I'm going to focus on for that quarter or for that year. And it really makes it easy to answer questions because um, if, for example, and it's not saying what's most important to you, but it's saying, what do I need to spend my most time on right now? Right. Because, so, you know, most people would say most important, oh, God, family, whatever, right? And beyond, it would always be the same. Um, 
So instead, what you do is you look at it as where are you going to focus for the next quarter or six months. And so for me, I, I rearrange based on where I'm at in life. So let's say my, my health was not that good. I'd be like, oh, that's top right now. Um, or if I just got back from doing a really cool like triathlon or something, maybe this quarter I'm going to bring that down. So I'm just going to chill, you know? Right. Um, so that helps a lot though, because when people come to you and ask you something, you don't have to think about it. You just go, where does that fit on my priorities right now? Right. And that removes the pressure from you having to justify to yourself whether you want to do it or not do it. So what I mean is you make that choice early. And then it's a whole lot easier just to be like, oh, um, check here. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I can't. I already have this commitment, that commitment, this commitment. You know, yeah. the people. And yeah, I get people that are still upset about it. But you just kind of learn to go on. You know? Yeah, I see so many people uh, floating through life without any sort of vision for themselves, a plan, a life plan, you probably call, the life call plan. It that same thing. Yeah. You know, people are just aimlessly saying yes to different things, different opportunities. And we all, you know, the trap that I fell into was the kind of the societal norms that we say that we're supposed to do. You know, the mortgage, the, you know, two and a half kids, you know, college, you know, all the debt that goes along with that. You know, no, not too many people actually decide exactly what they want their lives to be like. So I like that you, you mentioned the life plan. So um, let's maybe unpack that a little bit. Like what does that process specifically look like for you? Just to give some of our listeners yeah. an idea. To yeah, sure. So for me, I actually have a uh, sort of coach that I pay and work with. Well, actually I haven't paid him in, in, in a while. We've become very good friends now. So he won't, I don't really pay him anymore, but, Actually, I don't think I even ever did. Actually, yeah. So long story short, I always like to be as upfront as I can. He was my pastor and he was looking into becoming a coach and he has very good experience, actually. Very business minded type type guy, very spiritual, but not like in your face type guy, you know? Right. And, um, you know, so he actually offered to sort of coach me free he had been through coaching himself for quite some time. Yeah. So he was like, you know, so anyway, I was like, yeah, sure. Let's try it out. And best move I ever made. So basically yeah. long story short, what, what the process is like is I like to take off, you know, and I end up doing, you're supposed to do them every quarter. Like yeah. he does, he's very good at it. Me, I'm not, I, I like the principle of it, but I'm bad at the execution doing it all the time. So I tend to do mine like once a year, maybe twice a year. Yeah. Um, um, but I feel like for me, time goes so fast. It's fine. <laughs> Cause I just, I'm like, it's been six months. What in the world, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. but, but yeah, the, um, so what I do mainly is we're in the end of December, you know, the end of December is always like a dead time, no matter what you try to do. Even right. us, we, we come back to work and like half my staff, I feel like they're on their phones like, yeah, I'm at work, but they're not, you know, just sitting there. Like no one's really doing anything. It's just, and I've come to just accept that. Yep. Um, but that kind of last week of December, I tend to try to go somewhere. I don't go far, but I'll go to a hotel or to the beach somewhere because I'm, you know, right by the beach here. So I'll go somewhere again, offsite. And I'll really look at the year backwards and say, you know, what did I accomplish? What did I regret? What did I succeed on? What, what would I change? And I look around and I kind of do an assessment of every account. That's what you call them. You call them an account. So you could have like your health account, your job account, your investment account, whatever, all the areas, your spouse. And it's up to you to break it down because me and you could have completely different things, right? Right. Um, Maybe you got kids. I, I don't have kids, whatever. So, and you can separate those out. So you could say maybe some people would just say family and that could mean their spouse and their kids. But some people may say, I've really done bad this year with my kids. I told them no to like everything. So I'm going to move, I'm going to break them out and it's kids. Right. Um, so basically when I'm there, I kind of go through that kind of ask myself questions and I look at where I was because when I write out the life plan, what, what you do is you kind of write where you're at currently where you want to be and then bullet points on what do you have to do to make that shift, to hit that gap, right? With that, there's a gap, right? The gap is where we are and where we want to be. And we know that we have to plug that gap with action. 
So what are those actions? What are they going to be? So you break. And the funny part is, literally, I can I can almost say at least eighty percent of the time you already know exactly what they are. Yeah. Very few people have I ever told them something and they go, "Oh, I never thought of that." They're like, "I know, I know, I know." Right? And and that's the reality. Like I tell people all the time, you know, truthfully, when it comes to like food and what we should eat and stuff, and there's people like I don't just don't know what to eat. It's like in general, you know, if I were to say, "What's better for you, a Twinkie?" Or a carrot, you know, like we know, right? right? But the but the struggle is in acting out what we know we should do, right? And and I, I heard a great quote, and it's so true. And it's just when it hit me, I was like, man, that's it. Humans are not slaves; like we cannot enslave ourselves. So that's the problem. We always think, okay, I'm going to make myself do this thing. I call it Monday morning syndrome. And what by that I mean. You meet so many people, and, and I say this as someone that used to weigh 540 pounds. So I've been through a long journey to get to where I'm at now, and not even saying I'm a success. I'm just saying I, I know this side of it. Monday morning syndrome is, is the whole diet thing, right? When are you going to start? Monday morning. What are you going to do before then? Binge, eat whatever you can possibly get your little hands on. And not only that, but you, you, you overestimate in the short term what you can do. So it becomes, hey, come Monday when I wake up, I'm going to go, um, I'm going to go jog one mile, bike three miles, go to my gym and swim, come back, drink my blueberry mocha latte protein sh green shake that I just found. And then I'm going to go bike to my job. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it becomes this like from zero to, a thousand, right? right. And, and so, and, and I think by doing that, we're trying to enslave ourselves. We're trying to say, I'm going to make myself do this. I'm going to have discipline. I'm going to do it. But I really don't believe that, that discipline is, a, is an instant change. I think right. that it's a, it's a progressive outcome. So anyway, I don't know why I went on that little rant, but, <laughs> well, but, good stuff. Yeah, but basically the life plan, it's all about focusing on how are you going to make those changes. And then I personally, my belief is there are no home runs, right? There's a lot of singles. So, in, you know, you, if you get a home run, to me, it's kind of like luck. You just kind of lucked into it. But you, you, yeah. you are taking the right, the right swings. But instead of trying to say this big shift, I'm going to, you know, crazy thing, just make incremental changes. So, example, for me, one of my goals for this year um, I thought about, you know, for my health side, I drink a ton of diet soda, like Coke Zero should be like my, my sponsor. Like I, I seriously, I, I spend so much on it, but I know me, I know that I couldn't December 31st drinking all of the soda I want January 1st, nothing. I just know that I would buck that and stop. So I made it my goal to cut down and I define that by at least two, you know, two, three times a day when I, when I would have drank a soda, drink something else. So I've done pretty good at that. Not great. And if I have a bad day, I might be like, I'm going to get an extra Coke Zero. You know, like that's my fight back. But yeah, but in general, I've, I've done better because I didn't set myself into this tight little spot. Um, so I, I think that's a big thing. Now, the personal development movement sometimes I agree with it. I think in principle, it's, it's the right way. But I think it's sometimes in, in practicality, it, people struggle because the, the, the gap is too big or the shift is too great. So I'll give you an example. When I was, you know, when I, going through my weight loss journey, I was on that weight loss show um, and it was on ABC. I, I started that show, I weighed 493 pounds. I ended that show, I weighed 238 pounds. Um, it was an awesome time to learn a ton of stuff. Um, you know, had just great experience. I, I would do it again and again and again. It took one year. Um, within about two years from that show being over, I got on a scale. I weighed 493 pounds, exactly the same weight. Now the personal development side would say you didn't make the mental shifts to keep it off. Right. And there's truth to that. But there's also a physical side that people don't really know or think about. And that is that hormonally and chemically and all this stuff, your body is, is evolved to do so many things to not lose weight. 
It, right. it goes into this terrible starvation mode. And now they've done a lot of studies and they've since found that when you have rapid weight loss, like, like I went through, um, the amount of people who keep that weight off for more than five years, guess what percentage that, that is according to most studies? Probably less than 10%. Yeah. Some studies have said less than 1%. Wow. So low, so low as to be rounded down to zero in many studies, which is mind blowing. Now we're not talking about losing 20, 30 pounds. We're talking hundred to, you know, 200. So there's two schools of thought there, right? Okay. Well, the mental part is so bad or screwed up and it's just going to repeat this again and again and again. But then there's also the physical part. And so for me being a personal development guy, I was beating myself up, beating myself up. Why can't I control myself? Why can't I change this? Why am I doing this? Why am I killing myself? And of course, that's not good either. You're saying all this negative stuff, right? Right. Um, you know, but then finally I started studying the science side of it as well. And then I learned that there was all these things going on that truthfully were beyond my control, which again is a tough part because we, we want to be in control, right? That's what we all strive for, to control everything. And it's tough, especially if you're self-driven and you, your results focused, like you never want to admit that there's something that you can't control or fix, right? Yeah. And um, that for me was my big, my big breakthrough. And it sort of, it sort of co uh, what's the word, coalesce with me yes. finally deciding to go through and get a procedure, which is called the duodenal switch, um, which is basically a, a form of bariatric surgery that's only done when, you know, it's, it's a metabolic surgery when your metabolic rate is just wrecked. So like mine was wrecked. I found out that I was burning calories at about almost half of what I should have been. So even if I was eating a thousand calories a day, it would be as if my body was eating two to 3000 per day. So that was why even when I was eating quote unquote good, my weight was staying the same or going up. So anyway, I had that surgery, didn't make a whole lot of drastic changes. And literally it's been over three years now and I've lost over uh, 300 pounds and kept the weight off. And I haven't had to make these huge mental shifts. I've made a lot of small shifts. So I got back in the gym almost three years ago and I would go to the gym dressed in jeans, regular shoes, and just a regular shirt. And I went to the gym not to sweat, not to do, not to do anything other than to go to the gym to get it in my mind that this is what I do. And I would go and I would do like a little bit of chest press, a little back pull or two and be out of there. But I did it three days a week. And after about six to eight months, I was like, you know, maybe I should put on some, uh, some gym clothes. So I, you know, maybe I'll do a little more. I didn't make that choice. I didn't have to like, like hype myself up. I'm going to wear gym shorts. I'm doing it. You know, it wasn't nothing like that. I made the choice. And then I did that for about six months. And then I was like, you know, I've been about a year, lost all this weight. Maybe I should get serious about trying to do a little more to like weight lift, you know? And then I started doing that. And again, my choice. So as remember I said, you, it's really hard to, and, and you can't in, uh, slave yourself, right? So, yeah. so then I went and I started to do more weights and then I found a new trainer and then I signed up with him and then did about a year of like three days a week and I feel pretty good. And then I was like, you know, I should maybe be doing this a little bit more. Maybe I should ramp it up. Maybe I should be taking some more supplements. And, and now I'm doing four days a week training. I'm on like 20 different things that I take. And again, all was my choice. Now, if we jump backwards to day one, there's no way I would have done, done what I'm doing now on day one. It never would have happened. So a big thing that I heard Tony Robbins say once that I think is very true is that we overestimate what we can do in one year, but we wildly underestimate what we can do in 10. Yes. And you know, it's so true because again, we want, when do we want it now? We want things that happen now. So we're like, Hey, let's get, I want to find my, my wife, get, married. I want to lose all this weight. I want to start a, a huge company. I, you know what I mean? Like we just name every goal we've ever had and like, I'm going to do it in one year. Right. Um, one other way to say that is there are no unrealistic goals, only unrealistic timeframes. 
Yes. Right. Um, so anyway, yeah, I could go on and on about this stuff, but no, that's good. It's, it's all good stuff. And you know, I want to back up to a point that you made in that we already know exactly what we need to do. And I find that so true with, you know, people I interact with on a regular basis. Like we already know, we just need to take a step back and just kind of lay it out so we can actually see what we need to do to get from point A to point B. And, you know, you don't have to have this complicated, like, you know, going on a vision quest every, every year to figure that out for yourself. And you laid it out very beautifully. Like, you know, I'm at point A right now. I want to be at point B. And, you know, it, it doesn't have to be these, uh, these super complicated tools to uh, get you to move in the right direction, get you actually moving towards your goals. So, well, yeah, the, the other cool part, too, is the science shows that the longer, it, this is just one example, the longer it takes you to lose weight, the better you'll keep the weight off. Oh, yeah. Um, it's just because you're creating lifestyle changes, right? You're creating sustainable changes. I believe that applies to almost everything. The longer it takes you to earn money in general, the more you respect it, the more you, yes. you feel like you've earned it, right? Um, it's like getting that when you were a kid, you get, to, you get, you get your first car. You know, you almost won't ever love any car as much as your first car, you know, because it's right. your, yours, you know? Um, and, and it's the same type of thing, especially if you helped pay pay for that car, right? Oh, you yeah. have something, you know, in it. Um, you know, that's, that's a big part of success. Like if I was ever going to write a book, it'd be called like do less now, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like it's this idea that we need to make it. So like you talked about going from A to B, I think people in their minds think, okay, A is, is, is here and B is there, but really they're mistaking B for Z, right? And, you're, and they're setting their goals and their visions off Z instead of B. And B should just be an easy win, an easy win goal. And then you let it build and you let it build and you let it build. Yeah. Well, you know, I've seen different schools of thought um, around whether we should make reasonable goals or set our goals high. Where do you kind of, you know, is the yeah. high goal kind of that, that, that longer term goal? And then, and then the near term are those like those collecting those wins along the way to that, that stretch goal? Yeah. So I have two, I guess, two ways to, to, I guess, I, I guess maybe let's separate it out. Let's separate out strategy from execution, from vision. All right. So I think that your vision should be as big as you can dream it to be. Yeah. Right. So like if your goal one day is to, you know, be a billionaire, then write that down. One day I will be a billionaire. But you have to know that your view on that is so in the distant future that it doesn't really mean anything other than the ideas there. So at least you're getting, if you believe in this, you're getting your subconscious starting. It's just yeah. starting to turn the wheels a little bitty bit. I'm going to think about that in the back uh, recesses of my brain. So vision is the moonshot. That's where you want to be, you know, where yeah. you want to be. I, we call it compass. Like what's your compass sort of drive, um, you know, your end goal, where you're trying to get to. Um, that's the vision side. Then the strategy side is, okay, well, let's just say my goal is a billionaire. How am I going to get there? What are the strategies I'm going to employ? So you know, uh, you're not going to be a billionaire if you don't, you know, just if you work at a job most likely. So you are thinking, what, what's the vehicle or the, the strategy that I want to employ to make that stuff happen? So maybe it is a very good job that you could own your own company. You know? So then you start creating the strategy around that. And then where I'm focusing on more or less when I talk about the smaller steps is execution. So how are you going to execute those steps, right? And then that's where I believe you need to really chunk them down. And especially depending upon, upon where you're at, in you know, in your kind of like your life and your development, if you're at a point where you really need um, structure, right? And then okay, and then okay, and then that's important for you. So you need to kind of have your structure, and you need to focus on easy wins. Like, what's an easy right. win? You win because you want to build that up and develop momentum, and then you can start making the gap wider and wider. It's just like if you were gonna, you know, do jumps right you wouldn't your first jump wouldn't be a 40 
foot chasm, right? You want right. to start with a foot, you know, I did it. Um, proving is the, the ultimate thing is the only person you're trying to prove things to is yourself. Yeah. You know, and once you prove it to, to yourself, then you think, well, maybe I can do and say, I just, jumped, I just did a foot jump. Maybe I can do two feet. Let's see, you know, and five years go by and you're evil Knievel doing a jump in the grand Canyon, you know, or whatever. Right. That's, right. that's kind of what I think. So I think it's, and I think it's also, it was really, really hard to work backwards. So you could say, Oh, I'm going to be a billionaire in 10 years. Okay. The problem is, especially these days, the world's changing so rapidly that a plan you create now for 10 years from now may not even be even in the realm of reality. We don't know 10 years from now, there could be complete cultural shifts. There could be so many things have changed technology, right? So it's really hard. That's, that's the thing we deal with, with companies, you know, I believe you can probably plan out about three to five years and anything beyond that. You really start to get, it just gets very foggy. Yeah. Hazy. Yeah. You can't, uh, you know, it's, it's good to have those long-term end, end states, but you, you can't, uh, you know, I like to try and stay focused on, uh, you know, week to week, month to month and quarter to quarter. Uh, yeah. keep, keep things, uh, chugging along that way with, while keeping an eye on the future and, you know, quarter to quarter things definitely change. And, and I know year to year things radically change for me. I don't know what your experience is, but I, I totally yeah. agree with you there. Yeah. There's, I mean, the world we're undergoing such rapid change now so quickly. I mean, think about right now there's a lot of people and maybe there will be, you know, it'll come back, but thinking about how many people last year, we're like, oh man, I am going to crank away. Or I guess it was the year before now or whatever it was. But they're like, man, I'm going to crank away and build my whole life around crypto currency. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, in 10 years from now, we're gonna, I'm going to own the biggest crypto thing there is. Well, who knows, right? Maybe it's not going to be even be here. Or maybe it'll be awesome. I don't know. I mean, the point is we don't know. But if you had built a whole, you spent six months of your life creating a whole long-term plan around that, might be just all been a big waste. Um, again, though, it doesn't mean don't, don't, you know, I'm not saying don't dream, don't have it, you know, you should, because that it's that end goal, that vision that will sort of carry you when times get hard. Yeah. You know, think yeah. About and if you st stay locked into a specific plan, uh, you, you miss out on so many other opportunities and, and learning opportunities and, and, you know, you're kind of that, uh, old curmudgeon that says you can't, you know, can't tell, you yeah. can't, uh, who, who you can't tell, uh, they're tell that they're doing something wrong or, you know, that you're not humble enough to, to learn and, and, you know, see new things and see those opportunities on the horizon. So yeah. how do you balance staying on track with your goals versus, versus not staying locked into a specific plan? Do you know what I'm asking here? How do you kind of walk that, walk that fine line? Yeah. So basically you're saying, let's say, because you can sell it right both ways. Hey, stay yeah. focused, stay on track. Don't let anyone tell you you're not going to do it. You just bulldoze through versus, Hey, I think you're going down the wrong track here and you need to maybe rethink this thing. Um, that's a great question and a really, really hard, hard answer because I, I think the real answer is it all, it all depends, right? Cause yeah. you hear about every great story is like, you know, they told me it was never going to happen. They told me to quit. I was rejected 98 times. And on the 99th time is why we have this book, right? You know what I mean? Like, right. Um, so, but again, the other, the other side to that is it's so rare when it does happen. It, it's a big, big, big thing, right? We, yeah. it's all over. You hear about it, you know, oh, they, you know, um, um, the, the chicken soup for the soul books were rejected by like 30 publishers, right? And now they've sold like, I don't know, 20, 30 million of them. I don't know, a lot, right? Yeah. Um, so it is tough because, you know, I, I think what it comes down to is conviction, right? It's really a personal conviction. So there are people, and I tend to believe this way, that certain types of people, um, this, is, this gets a little philosophical because there's a little side to it, but there is a belief among some people that you're born to do something, destiny, right? Yeah. And, and so if you've felt that on your, 
just inside of you for so long, then I don't think no matter what anyone says, you're going to stop. So yeah. I think it's this conviction, then the depth of that conviction. Now, if you're like, you know, if in your own mind, you're kind of like, eh, uh, maybe I'm thinking, you know, you'll start to, you'll, it'll break down on its own. Um, but I, so I, I think now again, though, just cause you're convicted though, doesn't ultimately mean that you're going to be right. You know, there's right. people that were convicted to, to, you know, had the conviction to do all this, you know, what they thought was the right thing. And they would just give a go hurt people. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know what I mean? So there's that side to it. Um, uh, but yeah, in general, I think if I think you drive the bus as far as you can till you run out of gas. That's pretty much you're going to put it in a short way. Yeah. And you run out of gas and you just don't feel it anymore at that point. Maybe go on. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it sounds like you're staying in tune with your intuition as well. Trust yeah. Me. And, yeah. And just yeah. kind of, you know, it's it, conviction and intuition are pretty powerful, uh, powerful mix. They yeah. really are. And you know, it's funny cause I used to be very much like, I'm, a, I think I'm, I think I'm very like, a like, uh, logical type guy. And I used to think, Oh, intuition and what, what, all that stuff. But you know, now they're actually finding that a lot of these sort of gut instinct feels are the brain processing things, um, faster and better than we can consciously see it. Yeah. Consciously you know? process. Yeah. yeah. So it's like all it's is. So it's actually not just a gut instinct. It's actually taking in more factors than our conscious brain could ever take in, which is yeah. really weird. And especially it's, they believe it comes from when we were like out in the jungle and you heard a little sound instantly, your every sense is up and you're, oh, what's going on? You know, yeah, you're, you're, you're analyzing more things than your brain can. Yeah. Cause back then we didn't have time. We had to, you know, yeah. if you had a same yeah. tiger about to yeah. bite your head off. You didn't have time to think about, Hmm, am I actually in danger or not? Hmm. Let me think. Yeah. About yeah. Let me think about this. Yeah. yeah and, and now we're, we're in the point in time that we have that factor of safety to, to get into analysis paralysis and yep. overthink things. And, you know, I've, I've started to, over the past years, after I've gotten into this uh, personal development stuff, I've started to trust my gut a little bit more and, and, you know, don't, you know, certainly not doing anything reckless by any means, but definitely trusting my gut more and, and dialing into my own intuition has, has, you know, really allowed me to um, accelerate my own growth and accelerate um, the growth of my relationships, the growth of this podcast, the growth of relationships with, you know, many people like yourself that I interview on here. It's, 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 you know, you, you have to get out of your own way sometimes and, yeah. and, um, you know, get in tune with your thoughts. You know, I don't know if you meditate or anything, but, uh, you know, it's, it's getting in tune with your thoughts and like really being able to sniff out the BS and, uh, and, uh, get, get rid of those, uh, un, un, uh, productive thoughts, I guess. Yeah. I try to do the whole savers thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I do oh, that. Rod, yep. Yeah. Silence, affirmations, visualizations, exercise. I always forget, get them all read scribe yep yeah the one i probably don't do yet is scribe i need to get uh better at that one but yeah uh, i i write so much for my job stuff anyway that i i think i just it's like i write all the time you know um, yeah but yeah that's kind of what i do as well awesome man well um we are actually starting to bump up against time i feel like yeah. we're just getting the conversation going so we'll have yeah. to maybe uh uh circle up for round two down the road sometime here. But uh, before we let you go, how about you let us know um, how we can get in touch with you. If uh, people want to interact with you a little bit more on social media, how can they do that? Yeah, just go check out my blog actually. Um, I don't have any, anything on there for sale or anything like that. I think I have one course on there, but it's just kind of old course there, but it's um, only one mic.com. O N L Y O N E mic.com. Um, go on there, check it out. Um, and uh, you can, uh, I have a free book, things like that people can sign up for. Awesome, man. Well, definitely, uh, I'm definitely going to go check it out and definitely check out that book. And uh, I'll drop uh, this resource and anything else that you mentioned uh, in the show notes. And uh, thanks again for your time today. It was an epic conversation here. Thanks, man. This was fun. 
Thank you for tuning in to the Zero Excuses podcast. Join the conversation at KenyanZitzka.com in our Facebook group. And don't forget to rate and subscribe to our show. We'll talk to you next week. And always remember, results, not excuses. Excuses.